Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Luis De Rose, who is currently the Director of Cloud Engineering for HPC at Oracle. So prior to joining Oracle, uh, he did a stint with Amazon Web Services as a Senior Science Manager. Uh, and many of you probably remember him from Luis from his long standing time at uh, Cray, 16 years, as I'm told, uh, at, where he was served as a senior principal engineer and a program, programming environment director. So Luis matriculated at UIUC, where he obtained a computer science doctorate. Uh, and he's, uh, he's particularly well known in the HPC community for having several decades of experience uh, under his belt. And so that's uh, he brings a, a particularly interesting perspective to the cloud space, having this HPC experience. And so today um, he's going to provide an overview of the Oracle cloud infrastructure and discuss the design features for HPC that are incorporated into Oracle's cloud infrastructure that make the workloads uh, particularly uh, attractive for the HPC user base. With that, uh, I hand over the virtual floor to you, Luis. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thanks for the invitation. It's um, really uh, honored to be here and, and really glad. Uh, I, as I, I, I was talking to Jonathan just before, I've been involved with uh, NERST for many, many years, in fact, even before Cray. So NERST users have used the stuff that I've been uh, involved since uh, Seaborg, because I was at IBM for a while, and, and we had, uh, in fact, a tool that I developed called the HPM Toolkit that was uh, available on that platform. So most of you probably don't even use that platform, but uh, I've been involved in that. And then, yes, uh, 16 years at Cray, uh, have been involved with, with many of the, the NERSC systems, right? So yes, uh, today <clears throat> the plan is to talk about uh, kind of a retrospective on what's happening on what in the industry in the, and also talk about partly why I moved to the cloud and why I believe the cloud is, is really the, the, the future of HPC. Uh, cloud will have a huge component of that, on that, right? Uh, so my, I have to put this, but my, uh, the topics that I will present, starting with uh, trends in the computer architecture, right? So what's uh, some, like I said, a retrospective and, and things that happened in the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, and how that impacted the development of programming environments and midware environments. And that kind of is a little bit based on my experience, and in fact, more of my experience at at Cray, my previous companies. And then uh, I will also, then I will shift gears to what's the impact that we see on applications. And, and then I will go and talk a little bit more about HPC on the clouds. Why do, do I see or we see uh, HPC on the cloud or the cloud? Uh, a good platform or a great platform for HPC. And finishing the talk, I'll talk a little bit about the Oracle Clouds and, uh, and then the conclusions of the talk. Please, uh, I, I don't know what's the process on the, the, the seminar series. Uh, normally on presentation, I, I don't mind if people interrupt me with questions or stop me with questions. Uh, on virtual, I don't know how easy that this is, but uh, feel free to, if there is a way, feel free to interrupt me for questions at any time. Otherwise, we will have some time for questions at the end. So, about in, in around 2010, 
uh, Horowitz and, and team came up with these data, uh, which is quite interesting, right? So basically it showed that in around 2005, when the, the multi-core era started, showed this kind of a, this inflection point on, on a lot of these curves, right? The curves for transistors, the curves for the, the curves for number of cores, the power. And what we see is basically, as I said, in 2005, uh, the, the power consumption on processors got to a point that people could not increase the frequency anymore. It's interesting that at that time, people used to relate Moore's law to the increase of the performance of the processors, when in, in reality, it wasn't that. It was basically the increase on the number of transistors. But at the time, it was just correlating to more frequent, higher frequency, more performance. Uh, but what we saw is that the, 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 the power curve got to a point that we could not continue raising uh, the, the frequency, and that's when multi-core started, right? So basically 2005, uh, at the time at Cray, we were dealing with AMDs, and I, I, I believe it was uh, Barcelona was the first course of the multi-cores. And as you see, uh, the trend there is that the number of cores started to increase and every other curve, with the exception of transistors, kind of flattened out, right? The, the single thread performance, frequency, uh, power. Uh, more recently, in 2017, a, uh, sorry, uh, uh, so these trends, as I said, right? basically there were like uh, Moore's law talking about the increase. There was also Dennard's law that says that the performance per watt will double every two years. But again, due to the physics that couldn't happen and the, uh, but since the number of transistors was still increasing, so, and the, the architects could not uh, increase the, the, the frequency. So that's when uh, multi-core came up. And one thing that we also noticed was that at every new generation of a multi-core, the, the frequency in fact kind of dropped a little bit and then went up again. Uh, and all of this is because basically physics got in the way, right? And, and so there were too much heat produced, too much power consumed. And basically in 2017, uh, there was a group came up with an extended that same plot. And we see that the trends uh, continue the same way. We see, for example, at this point, if you see that already the number of uh, uh, processor with more than a hundred cores, uh, which already uh, started to, to show up at the end of last uh, decades, and all the other trends continue the same. So the, the problem there was still the same, right? So everything was uh, because of power, because of uh, heat, then the, what the industry response was, oh, let's, let's do multi-core, many-core, uh, GPUs, vectorization. And so this change, was affected quite a bit the, the industry, right? And affect quite a bit the users and affected quite a bit the developers. So, and as I mentioned, I will talk about what were the effects on 
people that were developing system software, like I spent quite a bit of my, my life uh, doing that. And I will also talk about how that affected the application developers and application users, right? So, um, so let's basically see initially the effect on the system software developers. And what I mean by system software development is basically uh, all the levels, right? But more, uh, I, I will focus a little bit more on the areas that are really affect the application users. So programming environments, middleware environments, like communication libraries and things like that. So in, I mean, in retrospect, uh, the 2000s uh, were in fact quite straightforward, right? So if I was developing a programming environment, uh, and let's say I was developing compilers, pretty straightforward. Uh, and basically you got the current architecture and you optimize for that architecture and come up the next one. Uh, X86 was dominating, dominating at the time. So you didn't have a lot of stuff to worry about other than getting the best performance out of that particular architecture. Well, with the new generation, what ended up happening then is that now we had a huge diversity in architectures, right? So the around 2010, uh, GPUs came into play. Uh, Oak Ridge was in fact the first one to come with a, a big supercomputing based on, on GPUs. So now we, we have to start working on developing for CPUs, developing for GPUs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Later on, uh, uh, ARM came into play. So then instead of being just the x86 uh, with AMD and Intel, now we had uh, the ARM options and we, we had GPUs option, right? GPU option. And even on ARM is interesting because we talk about ARM, but ARM is designed the, the architecture, but then the, the providers uh, build on top of that. So even if you are developing for ARM, you have different ways of, of optimizing depending on if it's a Fujitsu, if it's an Ampere, if it's a Marvel, and so forth, right? So, uh, so this, this huge diversity, it's quite interesting. And, and I spend quite a bit of time also in, in academia, right? So if you are a computer scientist doing research, that's an amazing time because what, what happened is you have all kinds of different things to look at and to experiment and to come up with new ideas and things like that. If you are developing system software, uh, it's really, really hard, right? Because now you, instead of doing just for one architecture, you have to think about this, this diversity. If you are, in fact, I, I put myself on, if I put the hat of, uh, if I'm buying a system, I can see that's also very hard, right? Because now you need to map the, the workloads for, uh, for your center to the best architectures that, that are available and I'll talk much more about that, but that's also quite a bit of a challenge, right? And uh, so, like I said, I spent quite a bit of time at Cray developing programming environments. So compiler developer became 
on a, on a company that has that will try to provide all kinds of processors it's it's really difficult because uh resource right so now instead of just focusing on one particular platform now you have this this diversity if if you are developing for a particular company like for example the intel developers then they still will focus only on the intel processors and the arm developers will focus on the arm processors and so forth but on a company uh, that's trying to provide uh, a, or, or to support this diversity, that was very, very hard, right? Uh, the other thing that I mentioned was uh, GPUs, right? So GPUs came into play around 2010. I believe one of the first meetings that I had about that was 08 or 09 already. And the, the main concern was, oh, we needed GPUs, but it has to be usable, right? And so with the, the I mean, the first problem is again, the, the, the diversity, right? So a CPU core is, is kind of heavyweight while the, the GPU core is lightweight uh, the CPU core is, is designed for complex logic. Uh, the, the GPU core is pretty much streaming designed for very simple logic. So, so they, they operate in that in a quite different ways, right? Uh, the only thing that happened was the, the, uh, creation or, or appearance of different programming models. Like one of the things that NVIDIA did quite well was uh, CUDA, uh, but CUDA was high uh, low level. So then there were new uh, programming models that were developed. One of them being uh, high level ways of programming the GPUs. The problem that uh, it took too much, too, too long to be adopted. So we ended up having two, two of them, right? So there was like OpenACC, in fact, even before OpenACC, there were different sets of directives to access GPUs, uh, the, the, the PGI directives, the CRA directives, the CAPS directives. We were able to kind of put all of these together, try to make this happen on OpenMP, but took too long. So OpenACC showed up and later on OpenMP target directive. So just these different sets of programming models uh, created yet another level of complexity, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then, Adding to that, the, you still want to do hybrid programming with CPUs and GPUs. And, and there were situations where uh, even at Cray, we had libraries that would explore. Uh, you could run, for example, VGEM running on the CPU and GPU, and you get like 20, 25% uh, increase in performance. So, but the, the, the overall complication, the, the overall Increasing complexity was uh, a big, a big thing here, right? So, from the applications point of view, uh, one thing that we see is that the the for quite some time the computer industry or the the computer the, the processor industry will basically focus on uh, the, the what's, what, what will give them the, the most return, right? So, and, and that tends to be commercial applications and gaming applications. So there is no uh, general purpose architecture that will work well for all 
applications, right? So or in other words, there is not one size fit all. And, and then there is a lot of compromise that had to be done, that has to be done. So you still kind of use an architecture and you can use uh, to, to get the best for your workload. But even on, at that level, uh, again, for the application developer, you have to adjust to the, to the architecture. And for the application user, or even if you think about the, the, the supercomputer center, right? Going after, going, deciding on what platform to, to acquire is, is very, very hard. So uh, back in, in 14, uh, Katie and Nick and others came up with this tech report from, from NERSC that basically showed the, and that was done in, on Hopper, and showed the, the diversity of codes uh, running on NERSC, right? Which really impressive uh, because you have many, many different areas of, uh, of research, many, many codes. And even, uh, I mean, if you, write, if you look at the right sides, uh, the one of the top codes, the, the community earth system model is already a, a couple model, right? So even on that code is really three different things, right? There is atmospheric, there is land, there is ocean. So you see that the diversity of uh, codes uh, makes it hard, very hard to, to decide on which, uh, which processor to, to, to have on your main system, right? Basically because you don't have, as I said before, you don't have all sides fit all, one size fits all, and you have this diversity of uh, codes and, and programming models and, and, and things like that, right? So, Again, if, if, you, uh, if you're thinking on from the, the perspective of the application developer, uh, you need to think about multiple levels of parallelism, right? So MPI is still the main uh, form of communication, the main form of parallelism. Uh, so that we still kind of got from, from the past, but uh, with wider nodes, uh, there is different ways of doing even your MPI, right? So, or how do you do MPI plus uh, a threaded model like OpenMP? And how do you take advantage of, of vectorization or accelerators, right, GPUs? So all of these, just added are, are different layers to this whole, uh, to, the, to the complexity, right? The other thing that happened in the industry and at the NERSC uh, with uh, Corey, you had uh, KNL that for example, had two levels of the memory hierarchy, right? So how do you uh, optimize for that? How do you take advantage uh, of, deciding what to put on HBM or what to put on, on regular memory. So a lot of the users of, of KNL end up not using the HBM as a memory, but just as a yet another layer of cache. But if you want to use as a, as a memory, uh, then again, more complexity, right? So as I said, um, the, the getting a system or for a diverse workload is really, really hard. Uh, and, and those are the three layers that I can think on uh, or where, where it's, it's uh, or let's call it three pillars, right? So, so the, the main one uh, of the complexity is capacity planning. 
So one can, uh, when one is going to, to decide on a system, uh, what's the best approach? Do you go for the uh, average uh, use, average capacity, or do you go to the maximum utilization? So what happened is if one goes to the average capacity uh, then or the average use, then what we'll see is a lot of users uh, being waiting on, on kills uh, because there are no resources available. If you go to the maximum capacity, then what you see is uh, probably, at least in the beginning, a lot of underutilized, which basically you lose on return of investment because you're paying quite a bit to, to get that. Uh, so it's interesting that if you hear people saying, oh, my, my system is close to 100% utilization, that also means there will be a lot of people just waiting on queues, right? Uh, I remember kind of on, on the side here, on the beginning of my, my career, uh, I spent quite a, quite a bit of time developing performance tools. And uh, I, I was at IBM at the time and used to interact quite a bit of the folks at NCSA. And one of them once told me that I was wasting my time doing performance tools development because people would invest much, much more in trying to figure out how to cheat the queue and get the job to run twice as to trying to optimize the code because you would gain much more by being able to do that, right? Of course, he was joking, but it's, it's something that I always remember like, yeah, if, if you are uh, waiting on the queue, it's just research or work that's not being done, right? So the, the other uh, big point is, is the cost. And one thing that I will uh, talk next is, in fact, more on the cost is, is what we call the cost of lost performance, right? So... And what, what happens is normally on-premise, what the systems are three to five years and, and the technology changes very, very rapidly, right? So and I, I have a slide that I will uh, talk more about that. And then the other pillar is the, the it's hard to optimize operations, right? So, uh, you need to basically take care of, of things like uh, security, which is always a pain. And you, you need to take care of, of uh, the optimization or the, the, the how to get uh, the best return of investment, which is again, uh, it's, it's, there are conflicting interests there because the best return of investment may not get the best productivity and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about the, the cost of lost performance. And that's, in fact, I'm using a plot from a, a, a paper from TAC, which shows uh, what happens on uh, over the years, right? Which uh, the different processors. So if, if we do a, a similar analogy on the right side, you see uh, the number of production jobs per year uh, on the Oracle clouds. And if I go back to looking into 2016 and, and can say, okay, 16, we had Broadwell, 17, Pascal, and then Skylake in 18, with Volta, 19, we had Naples, 
Twain, you had uh, Rome and Nampir uh, and Vidyan Pier and, and Ice Lake. So if you look at the right side of the, the graph here, the bar graph, what you see is, well, if, in, if someone bought a, the same system uh, in 2016 and they go on a five-year cycle, uh, then what happened is by 2020, and if you do like uh, rough math here, you see that uh, I would be starting close to uh, 1.5 uh, million. And by 2020, I am about 5 million. So like a 3X, let's call. Uh, so basically in these five years, there, were, there was a 3X loss in performance, which quite uh, significant, right? Uh, so that's, that's really something to, to pay attention. So that comes into, okay, based on all of this, uh, HPC in the cloud seems to be a very appealing idea, right? And, and, and the view is basically uh, the users really need an infrastructure that can adapt to their workloads uh, as opposed to the users or developers have to adapt to each new architecture every time that the new architecture shows up. So uh, one thing that happened, on, so the cloud has been around for quite some time, right? So uh, I would say beginning of 2000 or maybe 2005 around that, people were already using the cloud, starting to use the cloud for different uh, workloads and different uh, jobs, right? But HPC on the cloud is really a new, new thing, right? So, and the three main reasons for that, is, sorry, the two main reasons for that is one is people have been investing quite a bit on HPC and HPC has very specific needs that the original clouds or the initial clouds didn't provide, right? And one of them is a lot, the cloud is based a lot or has, have, has been based a lot on virtualization uh, and virtualization brings things like uh, jitter, and uh, a lot of overhead, which is not necessarily an issue for, for uh, commercial computing, but for scientific computing is, is, is a big problem, right? The other thing is uh, specialized networks were not available. Uh, so all of these, uh, were kind of uh, impactful to try to run HPC applications on, on the cloud. Uh, more recently, this is changing and I will talk why, uh, but things that we, we see is uh, CAE and bioscience have, have been uh, the early adopters, uh, but the, the Cloud market is growing quite a bit, right? So, and uh, Hyperion Research, which is one of the top uh, areas uh, or companies that provide information, kind of future looking, uh, their prediction is that the HPC market in uh, 2024, so three years, uh, will be around $46 billion. So that's quite a bit. Uh, another uh, researching uh, report 
is from Intersect 360, and that's a little older, uh, but basically saying that the cloud is the fastest growing segment uh, of the HPC market, right? And, uh, and then uh, Hyperion was saying, and that was on the, the publication at ISC this year, that the cloud revenue is projected to reach close to $9 billion in 2024. Uh, and that reflects a, 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 a compound annual growth rates of 17.6%. And while you see that on-prem, the, the growth rate is about 7%. So cloud is really growing quite a bit. And again, from that same report, uh, we see that the, the expected, uh, like I said, bioscience and CAE have been the early adopters, uh, but then whether geoscience, academia uh, are showing, in fact, the highest growth over uh, these uh, up to 2024, right? So overall, if I add, uh, academia and government labs and, and weather and defense. So the public sector is supposed to grow uh, aggregates like 20% year over year, right? So that's, that's quite a bit of a growth and quite interesting growth, right? So, uh, and then uh, why HPC is uh, uh, on the cloud is an appealing, is better than on-premise, right? So one, I, I, I mean, I talked the cost of loss performance, right? So one of the, the great things about the clouds is that you have the latest generations all the time, right? So basically with that, uh, one can eliminate the cost of loss performance. Uh, you don't need to, to do refresh cycles. Uh, you have basically, uh, you don't need to adjust your uh, application to a platform that was chosen for the center. You basically run on the application, on the, the, the architecture that fits better for that application, right? The other thing is you pay only for what you use uh, and uh, you basically, you, you run whenever you need, right? So you don't need to be waiting for the resource. And, and the other more for the center itself, you get out of the, the, the data center business, right? So you don't need to, to worry about, uh, electric bills, you don't need to worry about. I, I mean, throughout my career, uh, IBM and then Cray, how there were many times that a site had to wait for, because the data center wasn't ready or because the building wasn't ready. And, and the, in fact, it's interesting because the, the, the site with more experience when they are planning uh, an upgrade or a new system, sometimes the first thing that they would work on was the building, right? So, so uh, I remember one of the sites that, that I worked with that basically got the system and the system basically was, they had like 14 cabinets and they had to only put three operating because they didn't have room for the other 11. They had to wait for a whole year, which like, if you go back, remember the cost of loss performance, just one year of not using the, it's, it's the best year of the system. So uh, getting out of this business is, is in fact it's quite appealing. Uh, so how the users would benefit from moving to the cloud, uh, then again, is, is the cost, 
you you run uh, only when you need and uh, with the 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 architecture that best fits your your problems. Uh, you don't need to wait. Uh, so you you the, the flexibility that you have is quite good. And depending on your cloud provider, uh, there are performance, and I will talk about that next, but basically you can get the same performance on the cloud as you get on uh, on premise. So, and let's talk about that, right? And now I'll talk about the Oracle clouds and uh, basically a little bit of Oracle background, right? So it's interesting that a lot of people think about Oracle as a database company, but Oracle has been involved with HPC for quite some time, right? So Oracle bought DAC a while ago, long time ago, uh, bought Sun in 2010, and with that also bought kind of a stake on, on Mellanox, so, uh, and in fact, even today, uh, a lot of the systems that are built uh, for Oracle database are all based on, on the Sun uh, microsystems uh, background, or sorry, uh, team. Uh, in 2016, Oracle started with uh, the clouds. And one of the main difference from the other clouds that Oracle invested in bare metal. And I will talk a little bit more about that next. Uh, and then every year uh, since then, there has been a uh, updates, right? So 2021, now we have, we have uh, AMD Milan, uh, Ice Lake came end of 2010, beginning of, uh, sorry, 2020, beginning of 2021. Uh, we have these ARM processors uh, also that came in 2020, beginning of 2021. Uh, so one of the main difference compared to the other clouds is, so when, when Oracle came to the cloud in 2016, one of the things that they did was, in one hand, it was quite late. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, uh, not, I didn't mention, I was talking to Jonathan earlier. So one of the things that Oracle did was to bring a lot of experience to the team, right? People with experience on the cloud, with experience on HPC. And the idea was to look into how do we, what's working, what's not working, and how we can make uh, things better. So, so almost like a reboot, a V2 of the clouds. And, and one of them in particular for HPC was the use of bare metal instead of VMs, right? So, uh, and the other was related to the network. So, uh, so the Oracle clouds, uh, we do have, our focus is really on bare metal. We do have VMs uh, because we also provide support other uh, communities, but for HPC, the focus is really on getting uh, bare metal, uh, which provides a much better price performance. Uh, and provides, in fact, similar, I will have a slide that I will talk about that, but provides similar uh, performance to on-prem environments or even better depending on how you're comparing. Uh, Oracle is really uh, started as a database company. So uh, storage is part of the DNA, right? So, so uh, the, the, the storage at Oracle is really uh, first none, I mean, first class. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the specialized network, but 
that's another of the the things that were done in these let's call v2 uh or the the second generation of the clouds right uh we do have a uh all kinds of processors so we support the amd apex series uh as i mentioned we now have uh the the latest generation from AMD Milan uh, is already available. We do support, uh, of course, Intel, and we have Ice Lake uh, is our latest generation. We provide uh, ARM processors for Ampere, and those are in fact the the very dense processors. So uh, they they have one 160 cores, so uh, it's in fact the best per core is the best price performance, and of course we provide uh, Nvidia GPUs and we have Ampere uh, as uh, I mean the current generation, but as I mentioned before, we had Voltas and we had. Uh, Pascal's before. So how about the network, right? So, and, and that's an interesting thing to think about, uh, thing to think about is, think about uh, if the MPI test in your program are like marathon runners, what should you care about? Should you care about the fastest guy? Should you care the, about the average or the last, last place finisher? And of course you care about the last place finisher because that's what will make everybody else wait, right? Uh, and so that's another big difference on the, on the Oracle, uh, the Oracle Cloud is we do have a specialized network with very low latency. Uh, and high bandwidth, right? So, and, and also a very predictable performance. So again, very important for, for HPC because uh, you don't want uh, the, the, the variation on the performance of the network because that will, since all the, the HPC codes tend to be very well synchronized, you want the low latency and the, the high bandwidth, and you want the these uh, predictability, right? So we have CPU servers and GPU servers, and the exa data that's basically Oracle uh, uh, Prime product, all connected to the to the network, and we use uh, these what's called the Rocky V2. So basically it's RDMA over converged ethernet uh, as our network base. So the virtual network, so basically we also have uh, the, the network infrastructure. One other key point here is that is a uh, uh, no oversubscribed. Uh, so again, the goal is to get a predictable performance. And uh, as I mentioned before, right? So the storage is, is on Oracle's DNA. So we basically have uh, support all kinds of, of uh, parallel file systems uh, for high performance storage. Uh, we do, uh, IBM, Spectrum Scale, B, GFS, Luster, Qbytes, and others. The other thing on the, on the cloud that's quite interesting, and the Oracle Cloud looks uh, a lot into that, is the, what we call the hybrid cloud, right? So a lot of, a lot of users today, what they do is 
instead of getting, uh, so a lot of people still get on-prem systems and we see that that will be the trend for a while. The big difference is instead of getting the, the planning for the maximum utilization, what, what they do now is plan for the average or even lower utilization. And then you do cloud bursts. Uh, so you are connected to the cloud and when you need more, so you just burst into the cloud. So at Oracle, we have this thing that we call the outscaling uh, that allows you basically to go from on-prem directly to the, to the cloud whenever you need. And that's one way that you can address the, the, the waiting, right? That you would have otherwise on the on-prem if you get just the, the planning for the average capacity. So in terms of performance, uh, so I have a couple of slides that talk about uh, performance compared to uh, on-prem and, and uh, Oracle. So this one is on GPUs and you pretty much see on this right side here, uh, the, the green one is the, NVIDIA DDX and the, the uh, red one is OCI and pretty much the same capacity. And that's because of the, the bare metal. And the other one that's in fact, I think is more interesting is this comparison using open phone. And one interesting thing is that this, uh, the, the black dots from Kyushu University have exactly the same uh, system, the same uh, configuration as the Oracle clouds uh, when this was taken. And you see that the performance is exactly the same. So again, because we use bare metal, you have, the same, the same look and feel and the same performance as uh, you would have if you are running uh, on the cloud. Sorry, on-prem, on-premise. So you have the same performance on the cloud as you have on-prem. And of course, if the performance all depends on the system that you are using. Uh, I don't have the data about the systems on Osaka or this focus computational uh, science research and support center. But uh, you see that, yeah, depending on what you get, you may get better performance and you may get uh, uh, lower performance. But the, the big difference is that you can change your, your code and run on, on different architectures uh, on the cloud, right? So um, basically what I tried to convey here was uh, the, the trends in the microprocessor technology influenced quite a bit uh, the HPC life, right? And independent on what you are, if you are a system software developer, if you are a application developer, if you are an application user, uh, those chains made uh, a, a huge influence on, on your day-to-day -day life. And, and the main thing that happened was that, uh, as I said, the, the, the 2000s was kind of simple because we have a dominant platform. And uh, so you didn't need to worry about a lot of stuff, and, but that changed and, and changed on the way that you develop software in the way that you use software. And, uh, and really 
what uh, one would need is an architecture that we will adjust or an infrastructure that we are just to that as opposed to you having to adjust to whatever uh, platform you have. The other thing that I tried to convey is that, yeah, HPC is uh, the second generation of the cloud is really well suited for, uh, for HPC. And with that, HPC is growing quite a bit. Uh, and finally, the we call OCI, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Uh, we, we do have a very good product that because it's, it's based on uh, bare metal and a very specialized network, we can offer basically supercomputer level performance on the cloud. Uh, so we believe we do have uh, an infrastructure that can adapt to the workloads uh, needed needs. And that's it. Thank you very much.